Hello friends and welcome to this edition of Sleep Stories. Tonight we will continue with the reading of Beatrix Potter's stories. You can find shortcuts to the chapters in the description below. If you enjoy these readings, I would encourage you to subscribe, so you will be notified of upcoming sleep stories. So let us take a minute to unwind. Find yourself a comfortable place where you can relax. Once you have settled in, take a deep breath. There's nothing else you have to do today but unwind, get ready for sleep, and listen to these stories. And so we begin. The Tale of Mrs. Tittlemouse Once upon a time there was a woodmouse, and her name was Mrs. Tittlemouse. She lived in a bank under a hedge. Such a funny house. There were yards and yards of sandy passages, leading to storerooms and nut cellars and seed cellars all amongst the roots of the hedge. There was a kitchen, a parlor, a pantry, and a larder. Also, there was Mrs. Tittlemouse's bedroom, where she slept in a little box bed. Mrs. Tittlemouse was a most terribly tidy particular little mouse, always sweeping and dusting the soft sandy floors. Sometimes a beetle lost its way in the passages. Shush, shush, little dirty feet, said Mrs. Tittlemouse, clattering her dustpan. And one day a little old woman ran up and down in a red spotty cloak. Your house is on fire, Mother Ladybird. Fly away home to your children. Another day. A big fat spider came into shelter from the rain. Beg pardon, is this not Miss Muffet's? Go away, you bold bad spider, leaving ends of cobweb all over my nice clean house. She bundled the spider out at a window. He let himself down the hedge with a long thin bit of string. Mrs. Tittlemouse went on her way to a distant storeroom to fetch cherry stones and thistledown seed for dinner. All along the passage she sniffed and looked at the floor. I smell a smell of honey. Is it the cowslips outside in the hedge? I am sure I can see the marks of little dirty feet. Suddenly, round the corner, she met Babitty Bumble. Ziz, biz, biz, said the bumblebee. Mrs. Tittlemouse looked at her severely. She wished that she had a broom. Good day, Babitty Bumble. I should be glad to buy some beeswax. But what are you doing down here? Why do you always come in at a window? and say, ziz, biz, biz. Mrs. Tittlemouse began to get cross. Ziz, whiz, whiz, replied Babitty Bumble in a peevish squeak. She sidled down a passage and disappeared into a storeroom, which had been used for acorns. Mrs. Tittlemouse had eaten the acorns before Christmas. The storeroom ought to have been empty, but it was full of untidy dry moss. Mrs. Tittlemouse began to pull out the moss. Three or four other bees put their heads out and buzzed fiercely. I'm not in the habit of letting lodgings. This is an intrusion, said Mrs. Tittlemouse. 
I will have them turned out. Buzz, buzz, buzz. I wonder who would help me. Biz, whiz, whiz. I will not have Mr. Jackson. He never wipes his feet. Mrs. Tittlemouse decided to leave the bees till after dinner. When she got back to the parlor, she heard someone coughing in a fat voice. And there sat Mr. Jackson himself. He was sitting all over a small rocking chair, twiddling his thumbs and smiling, with his feet on the fender. He lived in a drain below the hedge, in a very dirty, wet ditch. How do you do, Mr. Jackson? Deary me, you have got very wet. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mrs. Tittlemouse. I'll sit a while and dry myself, said Mr. Jackson. He sat and smiled, and the water dripped off his coat tails. Mrs. Tittlemouse went round with a mop. He sat such a while that he had to be asked if he would take some dinner. First she offered him cherry stones. Thank you, thank you, Mrs. Tittlemouse. No teeth, no teeth. No teeth, said Mr. Jackson. He opened his mouth most unnecessarily wide. He certainly had not a tooth in his head. Then she offered him thistledown seed. Twiddly, widdly, widdly. Poof, poof, puff, said Mr. Jackson. He blew the thistle down all over the room. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mrs. Tittlemouse. Now, what I really, really should like would be a little dish of honey. I am afraid I have not got any, Mr. Jackson, said Mrs. Tittlemouse. Twiddly, widdly, widdly, Mrs. Tittlemouse, said the smiling Mr. Jackson. I can smell it. That is why I came to call. Mr. Jackson rose ponderously from the table and began to look into the cupboards. Mrs. Tittlemouse followed him with a dishcloth to wipe his large, wet footmarks off the parlor floor. When he had convinced himself that there was no honey in the cupboards, he began to walk down the passage. Indeed, indeed, you will stick fast, Mr. Jackson. Tiddly, widdly, widdly, Mrs. Tittlemouse. First he squeezed into the pantry. Tiddly, widdly, widdly, no honey, no honey, Mrs. Tittlemouse. There were three creepy, crawly people hiding in the plate rack. Two of them got away, but the littlest one he caught. Then he squeezed into the larder. Miss Butterfly was tasting the sugar, but she flew away out of the window. Tiddly, widdly, widdly, Mrs. Tittlemouse, you seem to have plenty of visitors. And without any invitation, said Mrs. Thomasina Tittlemouse. They went along the sandy passage. Tiddly, widdly, buzz, whiz, whiz. He met Babiti round the corner and snapped her up and put her down again. I do not like bumblebees. They are all over bristles, said Mr. Jackson, wiping his mouth with his coat sleeve. Get out, you nasty old toad, shrieked Papiti Bumble. I shall go distracted, scolded Mrs. Tittlemouse. She put herself up in the nut cellar, while Mr. Jackson pulled out the bee's nest. He seemed to have no objection to stings. When Mrs. Tittlemouse ventured to come out, everybody had gone away. But the untidiness was something dreadful. Never did I see such a mess, smears of honey, of moss, and thistledown, and marks of big and little feet, all over my nice clean house. She gathered up the moss and the remains of the beeswax. Then she went out and fetched some twigs, 
to partly close up the front door. I will make it too small for Mr. Jackson. She fetched soft soap and flannel, and a new scrubbing brush from the storeroom. But she was too tired to do any more. First she fell asleep in her chair, and then she went to bed. Will it ever be tidy again? said poor Mrs. Tittlemouse. Next morning she got up very early and began a spring cleaning which lasted a fortnight. She swept and scrubbed and dusted, and she rubbed up the furniture with beeswax, and polished her little tin spoons. When it was all beautifully neat and clean, she gave a party to five other little mice, without Mr. Jackson. He smelled the party and came up the bank, but he could not squeeze in at the door. So they handed him out acorn cupfuls of honeydew through the window, and he was not at all offended. He sat outside in the sun and said, Tiddly, widdly, widdly, your very good health, Mrs. Tiddlemouse. The Tale of Ginger and Pickles Once upon a time there was a village shop. The name over the window was Ginger and Pickles. It was a little, small shop, just the right size for dolls. Lucinda and Jane Dawcook always bought their groceries at Ginger and Pickles. The counter inside was a convenient height for rabbits. Ginger and Pickles sold red, spotty, pocket handkerchiefs at a penny three farthings. They also sold sugar and snuff and galoshes. In fact, although it was such a small shop, it sold nearly everything except a few things that you want in a hurry like bootlaces, hairpins, and mutton chops. Ginger and Pickles were the people who kept the shop. Ginger was a yellow tomcat, and Pickles was a terrier. The rabbits were always a little bit afraid of Pickles. The shop was also patronized by mice. Only the mice were rather afraid of Ginger. Ginger usually requested Pickles to serve them, because he said it made his mouth water. I cannot bear, said he, to see them going out at the door, carrying their little parcels. I have the same feeling about rats, replied Pickles, but it would never do to eat our own customers. They would leave us and go to Tabitha Twitchett's. On the contrary, they would go nowhere, replied Ginger gloomily. Tabitha Twitchett kept the only other shop in the village. She did not give credit. Ginger and Pickles gave unlimited credit. Now the meaning of credit is this. When a customer buys a bar of soap, Instead of the customer pulling out a purse and paying for it, she says she will pay another time. And Pickles makes a low bow and says, With pleasure, madam. And it is written down in a book. The customers come again and again and buy quantities, in spite of being afraid of ginger and pickles. But there is no money in what is called the till. The customers came in crowds every day and bought quantities, especially the toffee customers. But there was always no money. They never paid for as much as a pennyworth of peppermints. But the sales were enormous, ten times as large as Tabitha Twitchett's. As there was always no money, 
Ginger and Pickles were obliged to eat their own goods. Pickles ate biscuits, and Ginger ate a dried haddock. They ate them by candlelight after the shop was closed. When it came to January 1st, there was still no money, and Pickles was unable to buy a dog license. It is very unpleasant. I am afraid of the police, said Pickles. It is your own fault for being a terrier. I do not require a license, and neither does Cap, the collie dog. It is very uncomfortable. I am afraid I shall be summoned. I have tried in vain to get a license upon credit at the post office, said Pickles. The place is full of policemen. I met one as I was coming home. Let us send in the bill again to Samuel Whiskers, Ginger. He owes twenty-two nine for bacon. I do not believe he intends to pay at all, replied Ginger. And I feel sure that Anna Maria pockets things. Where are all the cream crackers? You have eaten them yourself, replied Ginger. Ginger and Pickles retired into the back parlor. They did accounts. They added up sums and sums and sums. Samuel Whiskers has run up a bill as long as his tail. He has had an ounce and three quarters of snuff since October. What is seven pounds of butter at one third? And a stick of sealing wax and four matches. Send in all the bills again to everybody with compts, replied Ginger. After a time, they heard a noise in the shop, as if something had been pushed in at the door. They came out of the back parlor. There was an envelope lying on the counter, and a policeman writing in a notebook. Pickles nearly had a fit. He barked and he barked, and made little rushes. Bite him, Pickles, bite him, spluttered Ginger behind the sugar barrel. He's only a German doll. The policeman went on writing in his notebook. Twice he put his pencil in his mouth and once he dipped it in the treacle. Pickles barked till he was hoarse, but still the policeman took no notice. He had beat eyes, and his helmet was sewed on with stitches. At length, on his last little rush, Pickles found that the shop was empty. The policeman had disappeared. But the envelope remained. Do you think that he has gone to fetch a real-life policeman? I am afraid it is a summons, said Pickles. No, replied Ginger, who had opened the envelope. It is the rates and taxes. Three pounds, nineteen, eleven and three quarters. This is the last straw, said Pickles. Let us close the shop. They put up the shutters and left but they have not removed from the neighborhood. In fact, some people wish they had gone further. Ginger is living in the Warren. I do not know what occupation he pursues. He looks stout and comfortable. Pickles is at present a gamekeeper. The closing of the shop caused great inconvenience. Tabitha Twitchit immediately raised the price of everything a half penny, and she continued to refuse to give credit. Of course, there are the tradesmen cards, the butcher, the fishman, and Timothy Baker. But a person cannot live on seed wigs and sponge cake and butter buns, not even when the sponge cake is as good as Timothy's. After a time, Mr. John Dormouse and his daughter began to sell peppermints and candles. But they did not keep self-fitting sixes, and it takes five mice to carry one seven-inch candle. Besides, the candles which they sell behave very strangely in warm weather. And Miss Dormouse refused to take back the ends 
when they were brought back to her with complaints. And when Mr. John Dormouse was complained to, he stayed in bed and would say nothing but very snug, which is not the way to carry on a retail business. So everybody was pleased when Sally Henny Penny sent out a printed poster to say that she was going to reopen the shop. Henny's opening sale. Grand Cooperative Jumbo. Penny's Penny Prices. Come buy, come try, come buy. The poster really was most enticing. There was a rush upon the opening day. The shop was cramped with customers, and there was crowds of mice upon the biscuit canisters. Sally Hennypenny gets rather flustered when she tries to count out change, and she insists on being paid cash, but she is quite harmless. And she has laid in a remarkable assortment of bargains. There is something to please everybody. The Tale of the Pie and the Patty Pan Pussycat sits by the fire. How should she be fair? In walks the little dog. Says, Pussy, are you there? How do you do, Mistress Pussy? Mistress Pussy, how do you do? I thank you kindly, little dog. I fare as well as you. Old Rhyme Once upon a time, there was a pussycat called Ribby, who invited a little dog called Duchess to tea. Come in good time, my dear Duchess, said Ribby's letter, and we will have something so very nice. I am baking it in a pie dish, a pie dish with a pink rim. You never tasted anything so good, and you shall eat it all. I will eat muffins, my dear Duchess, wrote Ribby. Duchess read the letter and wrote an answer. I will come with much pleasure at a quarter past four. But it is very strange. I was just going to invite you to come here, to supper, my dear Ribby, to eat something most delicious. I will come very punctually, my dear Ribby, wrote Duchess. And then, at the end, she added, I hope it isn't a mouse. And then she thought that did not look quite polite. So she scratched out, isn't a mouse, and changed it to, I hope it will be fine. And she gave her letter to the postman. But she thought a great deal about Ribby's pie, and she read Ribby's letter over and over again. I am dreadfully afraid it will be a mouse, said Duchess to herself. I really couldn't, couldn't eat mouse pie, and I shall have to eat it, because it is a party, and my pie was going to be veal and ham, a pink and white pie dish, and so is mine just like Ribby's dishes. They were both bought at Tabitha Twitchett's. Duchess went into her larder and took the pie off a shelf and looked at it. It's all ready to put in the oven. Such lovely pie crust. And I put in a little tin patty pan to hold up the crust. And I made a hole in the middle with a fork to let out the steam. Oh, I do wish I could eat my own pie, instead of a pie made of mouse. Duchess considered and considered, and read Ribby's letter again. A pink and white pie dish, and you shall eat it all. You means me. Then Ribby is not going to even taste the pie herself. A pink and white pie dish. Ribby is sure to go out to buy the muffins. Oh, what a good idea. Why shouldn't I rush along and put my pie into Ribby's oven when Ribby isn't there? Duchess was quite delighted with her own cleverness. Ribby, in the meantime, 
had received Duchess's answer, and as soon as she was sure that the little dog could come, she popped her pie into the oven. There were two ovens, one above the other. Some other knobs and handles were only ornamental, and not intended to open. Ribby put the pie into the lower oven. The door was very stiff. The top oven bakes too quickly, said Ribby to herself. It is a pie of the most delicate and tender mouse, minced up with bacon. And I have taken out all the bones, because Duchess did nearly choke herself with a fish bone last time I gave her a party. She eats a little fast. Rather big mouthfuls. But a most genteel and elegant little dog. Infinitely superior company to Cousin Tabitha Twitchit. Ribby put on some coal and swept up the hearth. Then she went out with a can to the well for water to fill up the kettle. Then she began to set the room in order, for it was the sitting room as well as the kitchen. She shook the mats out at the front door and put them straight. The hearth rug was a rabbit skin. She dusted the clock and the ornaments on the mantelpiece, and she polished and rubbed the tables and chairs. Then she spread a very clean white tablecloth and set out her best china tea set, which she took out of a wall cupboard near the fireplace. The teacups were white with a pattern of pink roses, and the dinner plates were white and blue. When Ribby had laid the table, she took a jug and a blue and white dish, and went out down the field to the farm to fetch milk and butter. When she came back, she peeped into the bottom oven. The pie looked very comfortable. Rippy put on her shawl and bonnet and went out again. With a basket to the village shop to buy a packet of tea, a pound of lump sugar, and a pot of marmalade. And just at the same time, Duchess came out of her house at the other end of the village. Ribby met Duchess halfway down the street, also carrying a basket covered with a cloth. They only bowed to one another. They did not speak, because they were going to have a party. As soon as Duchess had got around the corner out of sight, she simply ran straight away to Ribby's house. Ribby went into the shop and bought what she required, and came out after a pleasant gossip with Cousin Tabitha Twitchett. Cousin Tabitha was disdainful afterwards in conversation. A little dog indeed, just as if there were no cats in Sorry. And a pie for afternoon tea, the very idea, said Cousin Tabitha Twitchett. Ribby went on to Timothy Baker's and bought the muffins. Then she went home. There seemed to be a sort of scuffling noise in the back passage as she was coming in at the front door. I trust that is not that pie. The spoons are locked up, however, said Ribby. But there was nobody there. Ribby opened the bottom oven door with some difficulty and turned the pie. There began to be a pleasing smell of baked mouse. Duchess, in the meantime, had slipped out at the back door. It is a very odd thing that Ribby's pie was not in the oven when I put mine in, and I can't find it anywhere. I have looked all over the house. I put my pie into a nice hot oven at the top. I could not turn any of the other handles. I think that they are all shams said Duchess. But I wish I could have removed the pie made of mouse. I cannot think what she had done with it. I heard Ribby coming, and I had to run out by the back door. Duchess went home and brushed her beautiful black coat, and then she picked a bunch of flowers in her garden as a present for Ribby. 
and passed the time until the clock struck four. Ribby, having assured herself by careful search that there was really no one hiding in the cupboard or in the larder, went upstairs to change her dress. She put on a lilac silk gown for the party, and an embroidered muslin apron and tippet. It is very strange, said Ribby. I did not think. I left that drawer pulled out. Has somebody been trying on my mittens? She came downstairs again, and made the tea, and put the teapot on the hob. She peeped again into the bottom oven. The pie had become a lovely brown, and it was steaming hot. She sat down before the fire to wait for the little talk. I'm glad I used the bottom oven, said Ribby. The top one would certainly have been very much too hot. I wonder why that cupboard door was open. Can there really have been someone in the house? Very punctually, at four o'clock, Duchess started to go to the party. She ran so fast through the village that she was too early, and she had to wait a little while in the lane that leads down to Ribby's house. I wonder if Ribby has taken my pie out of the oven yet, said Duchess, and whatever can have become of the other pie made of mouse. At a quarter past four, to the minute, there came a most genteel little tap tapity. Is Mrs. Robinson at home? inquired Duchess in the porch. Come in, and how do you do, my dear Duchess? cried Ribby. I hope I see you well. Quite well, I thank you. And how do you do, my dear Ribby? said Duchess. I've brought you some flowers. What a delicious smell of pie. Oh, what lovely flowers. Yes, it is mouse and bacon. Do not talk about food, my dear Ribby, said Duchess. What a lovely white tea cloth. Is it done to a turn? Is it still in the oven? I think it wants another five minutes, said Ribby, just a shade longer. I will pour out the tea while we wait. Do you take sugar, my dear Duchess? Oh, yes, please, my dear Ribby, and may I have a lump upon my nose? With pleasure, my dear Duchess, how beautifully you beg. Oh, how sweetly pretty. Duchess sat up with the sugar on her nose and sniffed. How good that pie smells. I do love veal and ham. I mean to say, mouse and bacon. She dropped the sugar in confusion, and had to go hunting under the tea table, so did not see which oven Ribby opened in order to get out the pie. Ribby set the pie upon the table, and there was a very savory smell. Duchess came out from under the tablecloth, munching sugar and sat up on a chair. I will first cut the pie for you. I am going to have muffin and marmalade, said Ribby. Do you really prefer muffin? Mind the patty pan. I beg your pardon, said Ribby. May I pass you the marmalade, said Duchess hurriedly. The pie proved extremely toothsome, and the muffins light and hot. They disappeared rapidly, especially the pie. I think, thought the Duchess to herself, I think it would be wiser if I helped myself to pie. Though Ribby did not seem to notice anything when she was cutting it. What very small fine pieces it has cooked into. I did not remember that I minced it up so fine. I suppose this is a quicker oven than my own. How fast Duchess is eating, thought Ribby to herself as she buttered her fifth muffin. The pie dish was emptying rapidly. Duchess had had four helps already, and was fumbling with the spoon. A little more bacon, my dear Duchess, said Ribby. Thank you, my dear Ribby, I was only feeling for the patty pan. The patty pan, my dear Duchess? The patty pan that held up the pie crust. 
said Duchess, blushing under her black coat. Oh, I didn't put one in, my dear Duchess, said Ribby. I don't think that it is necessary in pies made of mouse. Duchess fumbled with the spoon. I can't find it, she said anxiously. There isn't a patty pan, said Ribby, looking perplexed. Yes, indeed, my dear Ribby, where can it have gone to? said Duchess. There most certainly is not one, my dear Duchess. I disapprove of tin articles in puddings and pies. It is most undesirable, especially when people swallow in lumps, she added in a lower voice. Duchess looked very much alarmed, and continued to scoop the inside of the pie dish. My great-aunt Squintina, grandmother of cousin Tabitha Twitchett, died of a thimble in a Christmas plum pudding. I never put any article of metal in my puddings or pies. Duchess looked aghast, and tilted up the pie dish. I have only four patty pans, and they're all in the cupboards. Duchess set up a howl. I shall die, I shall die, I have swallowed a patty pan. Oh, my dear Ribby, I do feel so ill. It is impossible, my dear Duchess, there was not a patty pan. Duchess moaned and whined and rocked herself about. Oh, I feel so dreadful. I have swallowed a patty pan. There was nothing in the pie, said Ribby severely. Yes, there was, my dear Ribby. I am sure I have swallowed it. Let me prop you up with a pillow, my dear Duchess. Where do you think you feel it? Oh, I do feel it all over me, my dear Ribby. I have swallowed a large tin patty pan with a sharp scalloped edge. Shall I run for the doctor? I will just lock up the spoons. Oh, yes, yes, fetch Dr. Maggotty, my dear Ribby. He is a pie himself. He will certainly understand. Ribby settled Duchess in an armchair before the fire, and went out and hurried to the village to look for the doctor. She found him at the smithy. He was occupied in putting rusty nails into a bottle of ink, which he had obtained at the post office. Gammon, ha, ha, said he, with his head on one side. Ribby explained that her guest had swallowed a patty pan. Spinach, ha, ha, said he, and accompanied her with alacrity. He hopped so fast that Ribby had to run. It was most conspicuous. All the village could see that Ribby was fetching the doctor. I knew they would overeat themselves, said Cousin Tabitha Twitchett. But while Ribby had been hunting for the doctor, a curious thing had happened to Duchess, who had been left by herself, sitting before the fire, sighing and groaning and feeling very unhappy. How could I have swallowed it, such a large thing as a patty pan? She got up and went to the table, and felt inside the pie dish again with a spoon. No, there is no patty pan, and I put one in, and nobody has eaten pie except me, so I must have swallowed it. She sat down again, and stared mournfully at the grate. The fire crackled and danced, and something sizzled. Duchess started. She opened the door of the top oven. Out came a rich, steamy flavor of veal and ham, and there stood a fine brown pie, and through a hole in the top of the pie crust there was a glimpse of a little tin patty pan. Duchess drew a long breath. Then I must have been eating mouse. No wonder I feel ill, but perhaps I should feel worse if I had really swallowed a patty pan. Duchess reflected. What a very awkward thing to have to explain to Ribby. I think I will put my pie in the backyard and say nothing about it. When I go home, I will run around to take it away. 
she put it outside the back door, and sat down again by the fire, and shut her eyes. When Ribby arrived with the doctor, she seemed fast asleep. Gammon! Ha! Ha! said the doctor. I am feeling very much better, said Duchess, waking up with a jump. I am truly glad to hear it. He has brought you a pill, my dear Duchess. I think I should feel quite well if he only felt my pulse, said Duchess, backing away from the magpie, who sidled up with something in his beak. It is only a bread pill. You had much better take it. Drink a little milk, my dear Duchess. Gammon? Gammon, said the doctor, while Duchess coughed and choked. Don't say that again, said Rebbe, losing her temper. Here, take this bread and jam, and get out into the yard. Gammon and spinach, ha, 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 shouted Dr. Maggotty, triumphantly outside the back door. I am feeling very much better, my dear Rebbe, said Duchess. Do you not think that I had better go home before it gets dark? Perhaps it might be wise, my dear Duchess. I will lend you a nice warm shawl, and you shall take my arm. I would not trouble you for worlds. I feel wonderfully better. One pill of Dr. Maggotty. Indeed, it is most admirable if it has cured you of a paddy pan. I will call directly after breakfast to ask how you have slept. Ribby and Duchess said goodbye affectionately, and Duchess started home. Halfway up the lane, she stopped and looked back. Ribby had gone in and shut her door. Duchess slipped through the fence and ran round to the back of Ribby's house and peeped into the yard. Upon the roof of the pigsty sat Dr. Maggotty and three jackdaws. The jackdaws were eating pie crust, and the magpie was drinking gravy out of a paddy pan. Gammon, ha, ha, he shouted when he saw Duchess's black nose peeping around the corner. Duchess ran home feeling uncommonly silly. When Ribby came out for a pailful of water to wash up the tea things, she found a pink and white pie dish lying smashed in the middle of the yard. The paddy pan was under the pump where Dr. Maggotty had considerately left it. Ribby stared with amazement. Did you ever see the like? So there really was a patty pan. But my patty pans are all in the kitchen cupboard. Well, I never did. Next time I want to give a party, I will invite Cousin Tabitha Twitchett. The Tale of Timmy Tiptoes Once upon a time there was a little fat, comfortable grey squirrel called Timmy Tiptoes. He had a nest thatched with leaves in the top of a tall tree, and he had a little squirrel wife called Goody. Timmy Tiptoes sat out, enjoying the breeze. He whisked his tail and chuckled. Little wife Goody, the nuts are ripe. We must lay up a store for winter and spring. Goody Tiptoes was busy pushing moss under the thatch. The nest is so snug we shall be sound asleep all winter. Then we shall wake up all the thinner when there is nothing to eat in springtime, replied prudent Timothy. When Timothy and Goody Tiptoes came to the nut thicket, they found other squirrels were there already. Timothy took off his jacket and hung it on a twig. They worked away quietly by themselves. Every day they made several journeys and picked quantities of nuts. They carried them away in bags and stored them in several hollow stumps near the tree where they had built their nest. When these stumps were full, they began to empty the bags into a hole high up a tree that had belonged to a woodpecker. The nuts rattled down 
down, down inside. How shall you ever get them out again? It is like a money box, said Goody. I shall be much thinner before springtime, my love, said Timothy Tiptoes, peeping into the hole. They did collect quantities, because they did not lose them. Squirrels who bury their nuts in the ground lose more than half, because they cannot remember their place. The most forgetful squirrel in the wood was called Silvertail. He began to dig, and he could not remember. And then he dug again and found some nuts that did not belong to him, and there was a fight. And other squirrels began to dig. The whole wood was in commotion. Unfortunately, just at this time, a flock of little birds flew by, from bush to bush, searching for green caterpillars and spiders. There were several sorts of little birds, twittering different songs. The first one sang, Who's been digging up my nuts? Who's been digging up my nuts? And another sang, Little bit of bread and no cheese. Little bit of bread and no cheese. The squirrels followed and listened. The first little bird flew into the bush, where Timmy and Goody Tiptoes were quietly tying up their bags, and it sang. Who's been digging up my nuts? Who's been digging up my nuts? Timothy Tiptoes went on with his work without replying. Indeed, the little bird did not expect an answer. It was only singing its natural song, and it meant nothing at all. But when the other squirrels heard that song, they rushed upon Timothy Tiptoes and cuffed and scratched him and upset his bag of nuts. The innocent little bird, which had caused all the mischief, flew away in a fright. Timmy rolled over and over, and then turned tail and flew towards his nest, followed by a crowd of squirrels, shouting, Who's been digging up my nuts? They caught him and dragged him up the very same tree, where there was the little round hole, and they pushed him in. The hole was much too small for Timothy Tiptoe's figure. They squeezed him dreadfully. It was a wonder they did not break his ribs. We will leave him here till he confesses, said Silvertail Squirrel, and he shouted into the hole, Who's been digging up my nuts? Timmy Tiptoes made no reply. He had tumbled down inside the tree, upon half a pack of nuts belonging to himself. He lay quite stunned and still. Goody Tiptoes picked up the nut bags and went home. She made a cup of tea for Timothy, but he didn't come and didn't come. Goody Tiptoes passed a lonely and unhappy night. Next morning she ventured back to the nut bushes to look for him. But the other unkind squirrels drove her away. She wandered all over the wood, calling, Timmy Tiptoes, Timmy Tiptoes, oh, where is Timmy Tiptoes? In the meantime, Timmy Tiptoes came to his senses. He found himself tucked up in a little moss bed, very much in the dark, feeling sore. It seemed to be underground. Timmy coughed and groaned, because his ribs hurted him. There was a chirpy noise, and a small, striped chipmunk appeared with a nightlight, and hoped he felt better. It was most kind to Timothy Tiptoes. It lent him its nightcap, and the house was full of provisions. The chipmunk explained that it had rained nuts through the top of the tree. Besides, I found a few buried. It laughed and chuckled when it heard Timmy's story. While Timmy was confined to bed, it ticed him to eat quantities. But how shall I ever get out through the hole unless I thin myself? My wife will be anxious. Just another nut, or two nuts. Let me crack them for you, said the chipmunk. Timmy Tiptoes grew fatter 
and fatter. Now, Goody Tiptoes had set to work again by herself. She did not put any more nuts into the woodpecker's hole, because she had always doubted how they could be got out again. She hid them under a tree root. They rattled down, down, down. Once, when Goody emptied an extra big bagful, there was a decided squeak. And next time Goody brought another bagful, a little striped chickmunk scrambled out in a hurry. It is getting perfectly full up downstairs. The sitting room is full, and they are rolling along the passage, and my husband, Chippy Haki, has run away and left me. What is the explanation of these showers of nuts? I am sure I beg your pardon. I did not know that anybody lived here, said Mrs. Goody Tiptoes. But where is Chippy Haki? My husband, Timmy Tiptoes, has run away too. I know where Chippy is, a little bird told me, said Mrs. Chippy Haki. She led the way to the woodpecker's tree, and they listened at the hole. Down below there was a noise of nutcrackers, and a fat squirrel voice and a thin squirrel voice were singing together. My little old man and I fell out, how shall we bring this matter about? Bring it about as well as you can, and get you gone, you little old man. You could squeeze in through that little round hole, said Goody Tiptoes. Yes, I could, said the chipmunk. But my husband, Chippy Haki, bites. Down below there was a noise of cracking nuts and nibbling, and then the fat squirrel voice and the thin squirrel voice sang, For the diddlum day, day diddle dum dee, day diddle diddle dum day. Then Goody peeped in at the hole and called down, Timmy Tiptoes? Oh, fie, Timmy Tiptoes! And Timmy replied, Is that you, Goody Tiptoes? Why, certainly. He came up and kissed Goody through the hole, but he was so fat that he could not get out. Chippy Haki was not too fat, but he did not want to come. He stayed down below and chuckled. And so it went on for a fortnight, till a big wind blew off the top of the tree and opened up the hole, and let in the rain. Then Timmy Tiptoes came out, and went home with an umbrella. But Chippy Haki continued to camp out for another week, although it was uncomfortable. At last a large bear came walking through the wood. Perhaps he also was looking for nuts. He seemed to be sniffing around. Chippy Haki went home in a hurry. And when Chippy Haki got home, he found he had caught a cold in his head, and he was more uncomfortable still. And now, Timmy and Goody Tiptoes keep their nut store fastened up with a little padlock. And whenever that little bird sees the chipmunks, he sings, Who's been digging up my nuts? Who's been digging up my nuts? But nobody ever answers. <laughs>